Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about um, my background. Uh, you have a bio. You'll see that I started my international career as a Peace Corps volunteer. Any former Peace Corps volunteers in the audience? Great, yes. <laughs> I, um, Peace Corps does a great job of teaching you the language of the country you're serving in. They also do an excellent job of giving you cross-cultural training. And um, part of that cross-cultural training is showing you how to behave uh, in a new culture. I was in a place called the Sultanate of Oman in the Arabian Peninsula. So they taught me Arabic. They also taught me how to act in a conservative um, Muslim Bedouin society. Um, and one of the activities they used was a quintessential Omani practice of eating dates and drinking coffee. Some of you are nodding your heads, so maybe you've done it. So I brought some dates with me, <laughs> dates from a, probably a California date palm tree, and I brought some coffee, and I brought enough for all of you. I've got more dates and two more thermoses of coffee in the back, so after the show, you're welcome to join me. In Oman, as in many places around the world, you, you eat with only your right hand. The left hand is for dirty things, the right hand is for eating. So, they taught us how to pick up a date with your right hand, and then with just one hand, separate the seed from the date, because you know, they all have seeds in them. Drop it into the tray, pop it in your mouth, and eat it. I won't eat it because it takes me forever to chew it, and I want to continue to talk. So um, I studied anthropology, and I was really into this. So I was an excellent date and coffee drinker. The coffee is also um, served with the right hand. Uh, sometimes it can be poured at a height with a flourish. Um, it's got that delicious cardamom in it. Um, and you accept it with your right hand and you drink not one, not two, but three cups, and three cups only, and after the third cup, Oh, this is good. You'll want to have some after the show. <laughs> after the third cup, you jiggle it like this. And this communicates to your host. Thank you very much. The coffee is delicious. Three is enough. So all of these practices and customs you needed to learn before you were allowed to go out into the country uh, and be a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, so. I'm out my first week eating coffee, uh, drinking coffee and eating dates, and my hosts bring me a tray of dates. Um, they pull off a cloth that had been covering them, covered with flies. Um, I reach in, I expertly separate the seed. In fact, in retrospect, that seed separated probably a little bit too easily. Because as I'm bringing the date up to my mouth, I see that it is covered with ants. I mean, there was like an ex more than an extended family. There was like a tribe <laughs> of ants or some ant-like bug. And they were even beginning to come down my hands. Now, time out for a minute. I'm also doing this tonight to pay tribute to Anthony Bourdain, yeah, whose adventures around the world, publicized through the CNN special Parts Unknown, introduced us to people and places and food that we'd never seen before and in ways that we had never imagined it or understood it. And one of his lessons or one of his messages was, it is so important to break bread, eat food with people on their terms, accept what they offer you. It is a sign of respect. It is a sign of recognition. 
Don't turn up your nose. Don't say, oh, no, I don't eat that. But you take it. You're grateful. That whole exchange is just so human and so important. So that was sort of a Bourdain moment for me. <laughs> Going back many, many years, I've got this date in my hand. The bugs are beginning to crawl down my, my fingers. What do I do? Do I throw it out? Do I discreetly tuck it under my napkin the way I used to do with lima beans growing up? Um, and you know, I'm a Peace Corps volunteer, so I am an ambassador for the United States. I am representing my country. I don't want to screw up. I don't want to seem like a, a, an ingrate or rude. I popped it in my mouth, and I washed it down with some coffee. <laughs> and I am sure that to this day, there are Bedouin who were there telling jokes about that stupid American who ate the date that was covered with bugs. <laughs> but anyway, um, I went on from being a Peace Corps volunteer to do a lot of work in, in uh, mainly the Middle East and, and parts of Africa, visited a lot of refugee camps. And um, what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, refugees and refugee resettlement. Um, but let's make sure we're all on the same page uh, we all understand the basics. The international law definition of a refugee is a person who has fled his or her home country because of persecution. Persecution because of their race, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion, or a particular social group that they're a member of. There are 25 million refugees in the world today. 25 million. Now, what happens to them when they flee their home country? Well, some of them make it to a refugee camp, and they wait there for years and years and years, hoping to go home. A tiny fraction of them might have an opportunity to integrate into the country they have fled to. And then an even smaller fraction have an opportunity to be resettled in another country. And we're going to talk about resettlement today. Now, the US government has had a refugee resettlement program um, that historically has been the largest in the world. We have welcomed more refugees to the United States than all of the other countries with refugee programs put together. Now, all of that changed in 2015. But historically, the US had a huge refugee resettlement program. Of course, in relation to our wealth and our resources, we're probably about number 25 on the list. But in terms of just raw numbers, the number of refugees we brought to this country, more than any other country, many more. The way the US government does it is we go overseas to refugee areas. Now, you would think, if you believed everything you heard during the last presidential campaign, that refugees were arriving on the beaches of, of Hammonasset and other coastal areas in Connecticut in rubber dinghies, and they were infiltrating into the, into the towns and cities of Connecticut um, without anyone knowing and setting up Sharia law uh, neighborhoods. No, that's not what's been happening. What happens is US government officials go overseas and that's where they do the selection. Not a single refugee arrives in this country who has not been thoroughly vetted. We're gonna talk about the vetting process. In fact, I don't have a panel, but I do have a bunch of helpers I've just randomly pulled out of the audience. So I am going to play the part of a US government official. Uh, that's why I'm the, one of the few people in the room with a tie and a clipboard. And I have asked uh, Joe, the famous photographer, whose photographs are on display on the green, to play the part of a United Nations official because he's wearing a shirt that is close to the color of the UN. It kind of matches or maybe it clashes with this hat. So Joe, why don't you come on up? I'll give you a microphone. Here's your cap. There we go. So we are going to the Zatari refugee camp 
in Jordan. That's a huge refugee camp, thousands of Syrian refugees on the border of Jordan and Syria. U.S. government official checking in with the United Nations, UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. They operate the camp. And I'm going to ask the UN official if he can give me a list of the most vulnerable families in the camp. Well, how about the best educated refugees' families? No, 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 no. You don't understand, Mr. UN official. I want the most vulnerable families, like maybe a single mom, four little kids, two of them are sick. They're all refugees. I know they've been interviewed five times, but I want those who are most in need of resettlement. Well, you mean, how about the refugees who speak the best English? No, you're not getting it, um, Mr. UN official. I'm thinking maybe a family from an ethnic group that has always been persecuted, that uh, even if uh, relative peace comes to their country, they're still going to have a rough time. Maybe they're from a very political family. And in the camp, there's a, although you would never admit it because the UN, in the camp, there is a little bit of danger for them. Vulnerable families. Well, let me think. How about the refugees who are the most employable? No. Think inscription on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Those are the families that I want. Thank you very much, Mr. UN official. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, now I see on the list that I've got Fatima, Abdullah, and Selwa. Please come on up. Fatima, Abdullah, and Selwa. Okay, you can sit here, Abdullah, Fatima, I want you to sit in the other chair. And uh, little Selwa, five-year-old daughter, can sit on the floor there. Okay, um, so uh, again, I know that you have been interviewed repeatedly, but I want to go over your file. I do have a lot of information about you, but I just want to check it and I want to ask you a few other additional uh, questions. Uh, Abdullah, I see that you are a baker in the city of Holmes, famous for your sesame seed cookies. In fact, people came from all over Syria to his bakery in Holmes to eat his sesame seed cookies. Uh, your bakery was badly damaged. Um, you boarded it up, and uh, you have had no means of income um, for quite a while. Uh, that's, that's when you were in Holmes. Uh, Fatima, um, you were studying to be an English teacher, I see. You studied uh, four months at the local university. It was shut down because shelling got too close to the university. It was too dangerous to go. Your education was interrupted. Um, and then you just had to stay at home. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that uh, your uh, five-year-old daughter, um, Selwa, has been badly traumatized. Uh, a barrel bomb dropped in their neighborhood, killed three of her neighbors right before her eyes. Little Selwa was usually very talkative, playful, even a mischievous little kid. But since that horrible day, she has not been speaking very much. She's been having nightmares. Um, and uh, the two of you, Abdullah and Fatima, are worried sick about her. Um, I need um, all of your fingerprints, please, fingerprints. Thank you, fingerprints, fingerprints, fingerprints. I need um, your, your passports and other documents, I guess uh, these are them here. Oh, passports, birth certificates, high school graduations, a bunch of other stuff, some photographs. I'm gonna pass these over to the FBI Forensics Laboratory. Thank you. Uh, and they'll examine those. Now I wanna get your story straight. I don't really understand what it was, finally, that forced you to leave Holmes. I know there was a lot of bad stuff going on. Um, was it uh, that horrible day when the barrel bomb blew up in the neighborhood, killed three of your neighbors, and traumatized your daughter? I, I don't think it was, because you stayed on longer, according to the information I have. Um, now, uh, Abdullah, was it after your bakery was blown up? Uh, no, because I see that... Uh, you boarded it up, but you still stayed in homes. You were doing day work um, and um, scrounging for jobs, trying to make a living, but you still stayed in homes. So what was it? What was the last straw, um, Fatima? 
It happened in November of last year. Selwa was at her grandmother's house next door and Abdullah was out looking for day labor and I was alone. The Syrian government soldiers came to the house. Uh, they broke the door down and let themselves in. They grabbed me and shouted at me. They wanted to know where my brother was hiding. My brother ran away months ago. He didn't want to join the army. They wanted to arrest him and I had no idea where he was hiding. They didn't believe me. They took me away to their military base and they threatened to torture me. They let me go, but they said they would return. Fatima went back to her house after that. She told Abdullah what happened. He said, we're out of here. Packed her bags. Everyone grabbed uh, all their valuables. Uh, Selwa was told she could bring one toy. Um, called a taxi. Instead of going the short way to Lebanon, you heard that road was too dangerous. You have to take the much, much longer route to Jordan. Um, you cross the border walking, carrying your suitcases and carrying Selwa, who was crying all the time. You grabbed another taxi, you made it to the refugee camp, and that's where the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee People welcomed you. You're in tent number 32, row H, and you've been there for six months. Okay, um, well look, thank you very much. Um, this is just a very small snippet of a three hour interview. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you can leave now and uh, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, so they go and they wait about six or seven months and then we call them back again. Come on back, We're right back again. Six or seven months later, they're back again. And uh, now the security vetting process begins. That was the initial interview. This is the part of the security screening and the interview begins to feel a little more like an interrogation. Abdullah, I need all of your addresses where you've ever lived. I need all of your phone numbers. That's, that means landlines, that means cell phones. The same thing for you, Fatima. All of the addresses where you've ever lived, all of your phone numbers, all of your social media accounts, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, whatever. We need the addresses of all of your relatives. Addresses of all of your relatives, their full names. Now, the last time you were here, you gave us a photograph of your wedding. We have circled some faces. Uh, we want you to tell us the names of the people in that wedding party. Um, we also need to know some dates. Um, when was that bakery? When was your bakery blown up? Um, what day did the barrel bomb fall in the neighborhood and kill the three neighbors? What was the date that those soldiers came to the house? need all this information. We're going to send it all to the FBI, to the CIA, to all of our national intelligence agencies. We'll also send the information along with the fingerprints and everything else to the intelligence agencies of governments that we're friendly with. We might even contact the Jordanian government to see if maybe they've been surveilling you or tapping your phone. He has escaped from the refugee camp three times to try to get work, and each time he was arrested by the Jordanian police. So you are on their radar. We'll pull all this information together and see if there are any, if there are any hits at all. Um, more questions about your bakery. Who are your suppliers? The names of your regular customers. Who were the other bakers in homes? Can you also give me some receipts or flyers or advertisements or maybe bags with your names on them, evidence that you actually own this bakery? At the university, now I know that Fatima, you were there for only four months, but I'd like to have the names of all of your professors, all of the courses that you were in, the names of all of your friends. Were you a member of any society or club? Did you go out and demonstrate in the early days of the uprising? Uh-huh, I see, Abdullah. 
I saw that in your file. You also demonstrated in the early days of the uprising. And there is a photograph of you, an Associated Press photograph of you. It appeared in the International Herald Tribune. That's another reason why you're afraid of going back. All right, you can uh, leave. And um, we'll be in touch with you if we need to talk to you again. Thank you very much. So they leave, and they wait another six months. And then we call them back again. Come on back again for another round of interviews. All right. Um, Abdullah, we have reliable information that there was a terrorist cell hiding in the basement of your bakery in March of 2016. This is critically important. Since the terrorist attacks in this country of 9-11, we have what's called the Patriot Act. Congress passed the Patriot Act. And within the Patriot Act, there is a clause that, set that it's, called the, it's called the material support bar. And what that means is anyone who has given material support, I mean anyone, even a refugee who, who, who meets uh, all of the requirements of, of being a refugee, if we find that someone has given material support to a terrorist or a terrorist organization, they are off the list. They're not allowed to come to the United States. So we have information that a terrorist group was hiding in the basement of your bakery in March 2016. What do you have to say about that? The bakery was boarded up in March of 2016. The bakery was boarded up in, the, in March of 2016. I, I stopped going there. It was too dangerous to go that, to that part of the city. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't even check on it anymore. You, you can't blame me for something I didn't even know anything about. We can't be sure. I'm sorry. You're off the list. We don't take chances and thousands of refugees are screened out during the vetting process. This is a vetting process that's been in place since 2001. We don't take chances. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to pretend that that did not happen. He doesn't even have a basement in his bakery because I want to bring this family through the process, get them to the United States, and we'll talk a little bit about resettlement. The, interrogate, oh, sorry, the interview continues. Fatima, I know this is going to be hard for you to talk about. I don't have any tissue here. I know this is going to be hard for you to talk about, but the day that the soldiers came to your house, what kind of vehicles did they arrive in? Where did they park the vehicles? What time of day was it? How many were there? What kind of uniforms did they have on? What kind of insignia did they have? What kind of accents did they speak with? Were they from Damascus? Were they from Aleppo? Were they from Holmes? Did you recognize any of them? How old were they? Where did they take you in your house when they initially spoke to you? What kind of questions did they ask you there? Who was in charge? Did you get his name? Did you notice his insignia? And when they took you from your house to their barracks, what route did they take? What vehicle did you ride in? What time of day was that? Where was the barracks that they took you? Where did they interview you in the barracks? Was it in a room? Was it in a hallway? Did they close the windows? Did they have you sit in a chair? Did they tie your hands? Did they blindfold you? What kind of questions did they ask you? How did they threaten to torture you? The US government vetting process of refugees is the most rigorous in the world. It is personal. It is re-traumatizing in some cases. It leaves no stone unturned. 
And it is by far the hardest way for anyone outside the United States to enter this country. So if you were a bad dude in Peshawar or Damascus or Kabul, drinking sweet tea and plotting to come to the United States to kill people. And we take these threats seriously. This is not a joking matter. That's why we need a tough vetting process. But if you were a bad dude planning to come to the United States, you would not say to your partner in crime, let's go through the US State Department refugee resettlement vetting process. So they wait another six months. We check back with the FBI forensics lab, and we ask them for their report. We have checked all the documents. They are all authentic, no forgeries, nothing fraudulent. They're clean. Great. Thank you, FBI. Are we going to get in trouble for um, putting someone in the position of an FBI agent? <laughs> I hope not. OK. Um, and they wait a little bit longer, and we run some more checks. And then finally, you're approved. You're going to come to the United States. But there is one more check, which is a health screening check. So you'll go through the health uh, screening. It is not as rigorous as the security vetting process. We are looking for mainly things like communicable diseases uh, and things like that, uh, active tuberculosis. Uh, and if you're clear on that, um, then you're good to go. Now, we do notice that uh, um, Sawa is probably suffering from some kind of a traumatic injury, uh, PTSD, not really clear. Uh, you have some health issues, but they're minor compared to Selwa's, and they've been on the back burner. Um, but um, you're, you're good to go. What, there's one more thing that we ask you, though. Um, do you have any friends or relatives in the United States who could help you with your resettlement? Uh, like a, an Uncle Ahmed in Detroit? Say no. No. Or uh, maybe Sister Saida in Louisville, Kentucky? No. 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 So they don't have anyone who can help. Um, so they're going to be arbitrarily assigned to a uh, refugee resettlement agency like IRIS uh, in a state they've never heard of uh, and cannot pronounce. You're going to Connecticut. So pack your bags. So they're packing their bags and getting ready. And meanwhile, over in at my office with this with, with a monitor that's not as modern as this. In my office, I get an email that says, uh, it, it's from the State Department uh, via a national organization we're affiliated with, and it says, family of three is arriving in two weeks. So we have basically two weeks to find an apartment, furnish it with donated furniture, um, stock the kitchen with food, and, um, and then find someone in the neighborhood who can cook a culturally appropriate hot meal. Again, I think of Anthony Bourdain, a culturally appropriate hot meal to serve you within two hours of your arrival. So we get all of that ready. Uh, there's one more uh, email that we get um, from the United Nations after they've arrived. It says they've arrived. We put them in a minivan. They're zipping up 95. They're going to hit traffic. They'll arrive in New Haven around 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. So we meet you. Um, so was crying and cranky. You guys are too exhausted to be excited about arriving in the United States. And um, we, we put you in a, in a, in a minivan um, and take you to your apartment. You eat that culturally appropriate hot meal. You have a good night's sleep. And then the next day, we bring you to the office. Now, this is happening all over the United States. This is, this is how refugee resettlement agencies 
uh, work. And refugees are still arriving, not as many as, as before, not as many as should be, but there are still refugees arriving. We welcomed a family last week, and we'll have another family coming next week. So you have your good night's sleep. The next day, case manager uh, brings you to the office and sits you down and says, OK, here's the program. First things first, we got to take care of Selwa's health issues. Um, we're lucky here in New Haven. We have an amazing partner. Yale New Haven Hospital has set up a refugee clinic, dedicated time to see refugees. So we're going to take care of Selwa, see what's going on. We might even have an Arabic-speaking child psychiatrist. You've got health issues that uh, you've been ignoring for a while. Um, uh, Abdullah's a tough guy, and he hasn't been complaining, but he has a terrible abscessed tooth. There's virtually no dental care in that uh, refugee camp, so we're going to take care of that. Fatima, you've got a ton of, of health issues that you've been ignoring. We're going to take care of those. So after the health, we'll probably get Selwa enrolled in school. She's six years old by now, so what's that, first grade? So we'll get her enrolled in school. We've got an education coordinator who will do that. You need to learn English, Fatima and Abdullah. And now, Fatima, you think you know English, studying it for four months at university, but you really don't. Um, so we have an English language class in our office. Again, we're a proud satellite of uh, New Haven um, adult education. Um, and then we have to help you get jobs. Now, notice I said jobs, plural. You're probably not going to make ends meet with just Abdullah part-time work, minimum wage. That's right, Abdullah. Now, Abdullah um, is crushed that he is not able to jump right into a bakery and start doing his famous sesame seed cookies. If you're lucky, you'll get a job as a dishwasher at Archie Moore's restaurant in New Haven. Raise your hand if you've been to Archie Moore's. Yes. Great restaurant, a great manager who hired you or offered you a job. Now, Abdullah is thinking, oh my God, I didn't come to the United States to be a dishwasher. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, that's where you'll probably have to begin. He's afraid he can't face his wife and daughter. And this was the most famous baker in all of Syria. This guy walked down the street and everybody knew him in homes. And now he's going to be washing dishes. But it's OK. You'll move up. You're a tough, hard worker. Take the job. And Fatima, you'll probably have to work part time at the downtown Marriott uh, Hotel housekeeping uh, until your English improves. But before you know it, Abdullah is working full time. Um, he is the best dishwasher, according to manager uh, Jim at Archie Moore's, they have ever seen. And no one is happier than Fatima because that allows her to go to Gateway Community College, study English, and her first real job will be probably at a much higher level than minimum wage. So this family is doing well, but wait a minute. Let's check on Selwa. Now, I talked with Selwa's teacher just the other day, and she told me that she is a sponge. She is learning so quickly. And in, in fact, um, she was student of the month last month at Fairhaven uh, Kindergarten through eight. But let's ask Selwa how she's doing. How are you doing, Selwa? Hi, my name is Selwa. I'm from Syria. I like my school, and I have a lot of friends. The teachers are nice. I translate for my mother and father all the time. I used to have bad dreams, but I'm better now. Oh, that's great. Way to go, Selwa. All right, so let's hear it for this family. And you can grab a date and coffee on your way back. So thank you all very much. They did a great job, didn't they? They really did. Um, this, thank you, this is happening all over the United States. Culturally appropriate hot meals being cooked, apartments being set up, people arriving from airports, learning English, 
getting their first jobs, adjusting, understanding this crazy country. Why would anyone want to mess with this? Well, why? Um, go back to 2015. Support and sympathy for refugees was at an all-time high. Remember those images, people crossing the, the, um, the Mediterranean and these, and these ridiculous boats that were, that were you know, just, just filled to capacity, uh, hundreds, thousands of people drowning uh, in an attempt to get to Europe. Um, in 2015, the United States welcomed 75,000 refugees to the United States. Because the crisis was so enormous, in 2016, we increased that number to 85,000. In 2017, it was supposed to be 110,000. Then President Obama at the United Nations declared for the whole world to hear from the UN summit in New York City at the end of 2016, he said, we will bring 110,000 refugees to the United States. Donald Trump was elected president and that number went from 110,000 down to 52,000. So 52,000 in 2017, in 2018, the year we're in now, it was supposed to be 45,000, which was low enough shamefully low, embarrassingly low, especially in light of the fact we're looking at the worst refugee crisis the world has ever seen. But we won't even get to 45,000 this year. We'll be lucky if we reach 22,000 refugees. Now, I saw, I'm sorry, it's a lot of numbers, but numbers matter. Numbers are people. One, two, three, a family of three people when we're bringing only 22,000 refugees instead of 100,000. That's a big difference. So the world was focused on the refugee crisis. There was great sympathy. And then there was a terrorist attack in Paris. Now, refugees had nothing to do with that. There were no refugees involved in that terrorist attack. There was a fake passport found by the body of one of the terrorists, but it was immediately determined to be fake. But facts didn't matter back then. The campaign was heating up. <clears throat> and candidates felt that it would be convenient to have a scapegoat, to have someone to blame for problems. Who would they pick? Well, they chose people who are relatively powerless in this country, vulnerable people, and people who unfortunately don't have a lot of support in the United States. They picked on refugees. And refugees were vilified during the campaign. You remember, and crazy things were said. Things like, we don't know who these refugees are. We don't know who they are, Abdullah, Fatima, and Salwa. We know more about them than we do about your next door neighbor. There's no vetting process. Come on. Of course there's a vetting process, the toughest vetting process in the world. They cost too much. Give me a break. Refugees are resettled on a very modest program. In fact, I forgot to mention, they took out loans to cover their airfare to come to the United States. Refugees pay their own way to get here. They have to hit the ground running. It's a tough self-help program. They have to accept the first job they're offered. We do not lavish a lot of money on refugees. It's probably the most efficient public-private partnership in this country. But again, facts didn't matter. But let me go back to something I said just a minute ago. Refugees do not have a lot of support in this country. Now, if you're a New Havener or if you live in Connecticut, you're probably thinking, that's, that's, that's wrong. Of course, there's great support for it. Well, New Haven and Connecticut, 
is a little exceptional. And we'll talk more about why that's the case. I hear somebody laughing. Maybe you think we're more compassionate, we're more intelligent. We're... No, that's not why, but we'll get into that. So why don't refugees have more support? Well, they don't have more support because most Americans don't know anything about refugees or refugee resettlement. I cannot expect an average American on the street to support refugee resettlement if they don't know anything about it. So why don't Americans know much about refugees? Why haven't they been involved and engaged? Well, let's go back, oh, 40 years or so. Refugees were resettled by community groups and private citizens. The structure that exists now, of nine voluntary national organizations and about 250 small nonprofit groups like IRIS, that structure didn't exist many years ago. Refugees were resettled by private citizens, by community groups, by synagogues, by churches, and they did just fine. After the Refugee Act was signed in 1980, the US government put some funding into refugee resettlement, and they also introduced some requirements and some structure, but they unintentionally cut out these vibrant, dedicated, active community groups. It was unintentional. The structure that was set up was putting money into nonprofit groups who hired staff and resettled refugees themselves, mainly in urban areas. And the private part, private citizens, the community groups, were less and less involved. Now, the private or the, the voluntary groups promised the government we'll not only do the work of resettling refugees if you give us a little money, we'll also involve the community. But honestly, I think they fell down on their promise. We've done an okay job, and I'm talking about my own organization, although we've made some changes. We've done, we in general, the refugee resettlement organizations, we've done an okay job of welcoming and resettling refugees, doing the bare minimum, spending the federal money, meeting the requirements, but we have not done a great job of engaging the public, of involving community groups. Why not? Well, we were never encouraged by the US government. In fact, we were actively discouraged. I started about 13 years ago at IRIS. It was then called Interfaith Refugee Ministry. And I see some people in the audience who were helping out um, when I first started, 13 years ago. And my first year or so on the job, I was scratching my head thinking, why don't more people know about us? I mean, in New Haven, no one had heard of this organization that I had just joined. In fact, uh, there was a, a humorous moment. I met with the head of a donor organization, and they said, we'd never heard of you, even though we gave you a grant. We thought it was to somebody with a name that sounded like yours. <laughs> So no one had heard of us, and I used to ask State Department officials at annual meetings, I'd raise my hand in the back of the audience after a State Department person had finished talking, and I would ask the question, why don't you guys, the State Department, that runs the refugee resettlement program in this great public-private partnership. Why don't you guys publicize this program more? Why don't you promote it more? Why don't you give us educational materials so we can go into schools and community groups and get more people involved? Why don't you lean on the White House so every time there's a State of the Union address, you select a refugee and put them in the balcony and the president can point to the refugee in the balcony and remind all Americans of this great, amazing American tradition of welcoming refugees. And they said, honestly, we think it's best for you guys to work under the radar. We think it's best for you guys to keep 
a low profile. Well, look where it's gotten us. When people start attacking refugees and spreading lies about them and reducing the number that are coming here from over 100,000 to just 22,000, there's hardly a peep. Yeah, there's been an outcry from the refugee resettlement agencies and from immigration attorneys and a few of you who are plugged in and involved in this program, but in general, there hasn't been an enormous outcry. So, what are we going to do about it? Well, what we're doing here is the reason why I'm here now. Um, we, for years, have been celebrating this program, getting the word out, speaking to journalists. Look, the average refugee resettlement agency doesn't even want to talk to journalists. They're deathly afraid they're going to say the wrong thing, be misquoted, there'll be a scandal, and the State Department will call them up and, and slap their hand. We need to publicize this program, get the word out. Probably the best way for people to understand refugees and refugee resettlement is to be part of the process. I've told my staff what we do in resettling refugees and finding people get jobs and connecting them to healthcare and walking kids to school and helping them learn English, what we do for refugees is too important to just keep it to ourselves. We have to involve other people. Now, in the old days, before the current model was created, refugees were resettled, remember I told you, by community groups, synagogues, churches, other groups. Well, that still happened at a much, much lower level. It still happened over the past 30 years, but not very much. In fact, over my first 10 years as the director of, of IRIS, only about one or two community groups stepped forward to say, hey, IRIS, train us and we'll resettle a refugee in our neighborhood. Only about one or two groups. Well, look how many groups have stepped forward since December 2015. More than 50 groups all over the state of Connecticut have said, we want to resettle refugees. And more than three, by now, more than 300 refugees have been resettled by these groups. So who are these groups? Well, a lot of the old characters. Churches, synagogues, now mosques have gotten into the action. Uh, rotary clubs, universities, colleges, just random people off the street. It is an amazing collection of people who have been motivated by two things. One, the enormous crisis refugees are facing, and Two, they've been motivated by the US government's attack on the refugee resettlement program. The people of Connecticut have really stepped forward. It has been amazing. So why isn't this happening in other states? It's not because we're the best people in the world in Connecticut. Um, no, it's not happening in other states where there are plenty of compassionate and smart and globally minded people. It's not happening in other states because it's not being promoted. It's as simple as that. And so you're asking, well, then why isn't it promoted? You know, uh, well, put yourself in the head of a refugee resettlement case manager or director. They might be a little nervous placing this vulnerable refugee family with a group of volunteers, semi-retired do-gooders who have no real specific expertise in resettling refugees. Will they really know how to do it? Well, let's look at this community group. A typical community group 
is filled with people who are retired doctors, attorneys, former principal of the local high school, uh, someone who ran a multi-million dollar business in New York and retired to Connecticut. Um, all of them have raised 2.5 children, uh, generally with great success. I mean, these are people who, with some training, can welcome a family of refugees and help them get off to a new start in this country. It's a model that has been used in Canada very successfully. In fact, many of you have probably read the, the New York Times series about private sponsorship of refugees in Canada. Uh, it's not only a great way for a family, a refugee family, to begin a new life in this country, it can save the refugee agencies some money by placing the refugee family with a group of volunteers, but it's also a great way to build public support for the refugee program. Behind every dot on this map, there are an average of 50 people who have learned about refugees, have met refugees, have helped them learn English and walk them to school. They have helped them shovel snow, rake leaves. They have explained why so many Americans run. They have uh, told them, hey, don't worry, that those aren't rats jumping from the tree to your rooftop, those are just squirrels. Uh, they've explained that, yes, Americans are clean and we are hygienic, even though we don't take our shoes off at the door, even though we do allow dogs into our homes. In fact, a refugee once whispered to me, he says, is it true that Americans sleep with their dogs? <laughs> there is this wonderful cross-cultural exchange that goes on when a community group welcomes a refugee family. And if you talk with co-sponsors, we call this community co-sponsorship, if you talk to co-sponsors who've had that experience, their testimonials are just so powerful. They say things like, this is the best project I've ever been involved in. Or, you know, for the past 20 years, I've lived in my town with Joe, but I never knew him, never knew he existed. And, you know, he's come from his church or synagogue and he's joined up with mine and we've got this group of atheists who have joined us and these students from the local college and we're all working together to welcome this refugee family from Syria. It is amazing. This should be happening in every state. And, and what would happen if the new, newly elected governor of Connecticut would suddenly take a position against refugees, there would be a massive demonstration at the Capitol, partly because of this. Don't we want that to happen in other states? Now, it's not just community co-sponsorship that a refugee resettlement agency needs to do. And, and, and I know that there are no directors of refugee resettlement agencies in the audience. There were last week when I was in Portland, and I, and I basically gave them the same, the same message. Um, it's not just community co-sponsorship to engage the community. You need to be inclusive. You need to swing open your doors and welcome everybody in. Now, I mentioned that our name used to be Interfaith Refugee Ministry. We were set up by the Episcopal Diocese of Connecticut. Um, they're, they're our parents. They gave us our start. And, and, and this was a typical kind of poster that you would see in our, in our office. Uh, and that resonates. With, it's, it's a cool poster. It's one of my favorites. It resonates with some people, but, with, but not with everyone. So instead, we started emphasizing, well, you know, this is an American tradition of welcoming refugees. And, and we started using symbols like the Statue of Liberty and, 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 and a poster of Einstein. Einstein was a refugee. Um, you know, that, that really uh, tells you something. And, and the images 
we're less religious and, and more, more secular. And, and, and we, we, we linked refugee resettlement to the great American immigrant tradition and, and used iconic images like this of, uh, of immigrants. The main idea that we want to get across is that welcoming refugees is a fundamental, universal, cross-cultural, human imperative. And it's also a very American idea. But it's not the only idea out there. And I know this is a festival of arts and ideas. And too often, uh, we're preaching to the converted or singing to the choir, or whatever that expression is. There are other ideas out there, and there, was a, there are some ideas expressed by the US Attorney General Jeff Sessions recently. I was going to ask someone from the audience to play, <laughs> but I thought that would be so unfair to play <laughs> Jeff Sessions. Um, but let's go back to that, one of the first things I said about an hour ago, the definition of a refugee. It's an international law definition of a refugee, and it's a definition that we, the United States, has adopted. A person who has fled his or her home country because they are persecuted or they have a well-founded fear of persecution because of their race, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion, or their membership in a particular social group. Now that is a piece of the definition that has been defined and expanded over the past few years. In 2014, there was a landmark decision in this country to include in that definition victims of extreme domestic violence or gang violence in a country where the government has neither the will or the ability to protect them. An important, an important decision on the part of our, of our uh, government. And it allowed thousands of people to legally claim asylum, which is the same as asking for refugee status, to claim asylum and to be given safety and a future in this country. But Attorney General Jeff Sessions has another idea. He wants to change that. And I'll read what he said recently. He said, that's right. The vast majority of current asylum claims are not valid. The mere fact that a country may have problems effectively policing certain crimes or that certain populations are more likely to be victims of crimes cannot itself establish an asylum claim. Now, is there an immigration attorney in the audience who would like, okay, great, an immigration attorney in the audience who would like to say something in response to that? This is very sad news because there is tremendous societal violence in the Central American countries. And the ravages of the civil wars have left society without any structure to protect people. Saying there are problems in policing does not describe the level of collusion between gangs and the police in Honduras. The police do not, will not, and cannot effectively police because the police are so involved in the gangs. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Jeff Sessions has also said, um, uh, he's spoken about the new um, US policy of separating uh, families at the border. Um, he says, look, most are not infants. Most of them are teenagers, although we do have a number of younger ones now, more than we've seen recently. 
Sessions goes on to say, they are maintained in a very safe environment, not by the law enforcement team at Homeland Security. They are put with health and human services, and they are kept close by. And if the person pleads guilty, they would be deported promptly, and they can take their children with them. We don't want to do this at all, but if people don't want to be separated from their children, they should not bring them with them. Now, what these families are doing is not illegal. It's always been, it's always been legal, and it's been a, a, an, Amer a, an American tradition uh, to accept people at the border who are fleeing persecution and to give them a chance to plead their case, uh, hopefully with an attorney. Most of them don't. Only 11% of asylum applications, again, that means people who are applying for refugee status here in this country, only 11% are ever accepted. So there are these competing ideas, um, and there are people who also will ask a very important question when I speak about the refugee resettlement program. People will say, okay, that's fine, but we have people in our own country, people who were born in the United States who need help. They're losing their jobs, they're losing their homes, they're going to soup kitchens for the first time. Why are we bringing all these foreigners in here? Why don't we just help our own people? So the answer to that um, is very simple. It's maybe profound and also very American. The answer is we can do both. Of course we have to help people who are born in this country. For every refugee resettlement agency, there should be a thousand nonprofits helping the general public. Count them, there are in Connecticut. And of course, we have to have a strong refugee resettlement program. Our, our place in the world, our role in the world, uh, it compels us to welcome refugees and to set an example to be a leader in refugee resettlement. When we cut our numbers, we also reduce the leverage that we have, the diplomatic clout that we have to lean on other countries and to ask them if they'll resettle refugees. And where is that picture of the boat? Here it is, here. And when the numbers, when the overall resettlement program shrinks, refugees sweating it out in refugee camps will lose hope. And when people lose hope, they do desperate things like putting your children on an inflated boat and risking their lives and yours to cross the Mediterranean to make it to a new world, a new life. We can't allow that to happen. We have a responsibility. So yes, there are competing ideas. Uh, the economy will go up and down but the Statue of Liberty stands tall, and if it stands for anything, it means that this country will always welcome refugees. And thank you for your help. Thank you for your time. <laughs>